There is no health without mental health. And optimal performance demands both. That's a quote from Dr. Justin Ross, sports psychologist who has been long vetted by athletes in the NFL, NBA, professional and amateur athletes alike, as well as a wonderful resource for CTS coaches. You may have read a recent CTS newsletter article featuring Dr. Ross about mental health and skills for sport performance. We'll touch on a few topics from that article today, but more deeply explore what mental health is, why it's important, and how to cultivate it in your life. We'll then learn specific techniques that you can apply to your own training to decrease anxiety, discover trust in the process, and develop a daily practice for a healthy mindset as an endurance athlete. This is also part one of a two-part series, so be sure to join us for that second part as well, which will come out in a few weeks uh, if you're listening right now. So with that said, let's meet our guest and start learning. Dr. Ross, welcome to the Train Right Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, this is this is wonderful to have you here uh, again as well. Um, in my recent episode, I did allude to the fact that we had this um, two part series coming out, but you know the 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 podcast gods deemed that one not to be <laughs> as worthy as this one is going to be, Doctor Ross. Yeah. Think- so thanks for taking the time again to do it. Oh yeah, man. My pleasure. I think that the technology gods tossed that first one aside. So I, you know, I'm excited to be back. But you know what though? Like we had a great conversation and only you, me and uh, Aspen really will, you know, ha- have been a part of it. Uh, so if Aspen, um, Dr. Ross's cat wants to join us again, you can join us uh, for all the cat lovers out there. <laughs> join on our YouTube <laughs> component of the train right podcast. Otherwise, uh, listen in for all the good stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Dr. Ross, I gave you, I gave our listeners a brief background on your work and kind of what you're up to today, but could you tell our listeners a bit more about yourself, your practice and where you're talking to us from? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, uh, yeah, my name is Justin. I'm a clinical psychologist in Denver, Colorado. And you know, the work that I do is really related to health and wellness and human performance. Um, I've long been interested in, in these areas that overlap the mind, the body, and, and optimal well-being, and really love playing in the playground of sport, working with athletes from all levels, from Little League baseball teams to those performing on the world stage, and a lot of amateur recreational adult folks just getting after it uh, for their own reasons. Um, so I, I love the work that I do. I'm deeply interested in all of these topics related to mental health and human performance, and excited to talk about it with you guys here today. Right on. Well, this is just kind of a curiosity question, Dr. Ross, but I, I, I'm curious, what got you into the field of sports psychology and why do you do what you do today? Yeah, great question. So I'd always been an athlete growing up, right? Loved sport as a little kid and was always playing something. And back then it was, you know, you played the sport based on the season, right? That's how we grew up. So you got right. to play a lot of right. different sports as a kid and as a teenager and was always coaching and, and volunteering and, and working with, you know, kids younger than myself and really thought I was going to go into sort of the physical side or the medical side, uh, working with athletes and went to college with that idea in mind, right? Whether that was pursuing like an athletic training, physical therapy, medical type of approach, and really just kind of fell in love with psychology as I was taking undergraduate psychology classes. And it kind of piqued my curiosity and kind of drove me in a, in a new direction. So after college, um, you know, applied to grad school in the areas of, of clinical psychology with an emphasis on health and wellness and performance. And, uh, and here I am all these years later, you know, really spending my, my career and a lot of my personal and professional time in these spaces. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like you are one of those who have truly found what you love to do and you're just doing it daily. Yeah, I think I got pretty lucky with that, right? I, you know, yeah. luck and support and privilege and opportunity, it all kind of commingled and just really found it a nice niche. And, you know, I think really recently in the past five years, maybe a little bit longer, there's been such an emergence of athletes understanding the importance of mental health and the importance of performance psychology skills and are really invested in, in learning how to make the most out of their mind to get the most out of their performance in whatever sport or domain that means for them. Yeah, that, re- that reminds me, I'm going to probably 
uh, weave that into some of our later topics, but that's an interesting point to bring up is just how I, I think more accepted sports psychology or psychology in general is right now and especially sports psychology. So we'll get there. But first I want to talk about mental health. And when, when I say mental health, I mean, for me anyway, is like the first thing that comes up is, is COVID and all the implications that, um, that has had in our society. And so, however, when I was making this outline and I was like, oh, mental health and COVID and, and all these words that we'll clearly define here later, I was like, well, what is mental health? Because I couldn't come up with it. I was throwing a lot of words down, but I'm like, well, I'm talking to an expert, so I'll just ask him. So Dr. Ross, what, what is the working definition? What is mental health? Yeah. So I, I always start with this general idea around health in the first place, which is health is more than the absence of disease. Right. And so I think often when you yeah. hear about mental health, what you hear about is sort of quote unquote mental health problems. Right. And really what I think about there, there really are not as many mental health problems as there are deep human reactions to the situations, to the lives, to the relationships that we find ourselves in. So my take on mental health is it's the physical, psychological, cognitive, emotional relationship experiences that we have based on being a human being. And sometimes those things can really point us in a place of optimism and vibrancy and wellness and living a life in alignment with values. And sometimes those things can really point us in a place of disruption, distress, dis-ease, not feeling well, hopelessness, right? And so mental health really just captures that human experience that is tied to so many different facets of our lives. Yeah, that's a, that's a great definition, all encompassing, but there's a lot to it, right? Absolutely. And yeah, and there's, there's a lot to it, which is why I think we determined that uh, having a two part episode to cover all of that and, and, and how to actually create mental health or cultivate it, um, is, is, is important. So I'd say let's, let's first, you know, if it's not say an absence of a disease, it's all, let's swing kind of in the opposite direction because there's a disease going around COVID, right? Let's talk about how that disease has really impacted us, anything from like politically to socially and this kind of environmental unrest. Um, I want to talk about that with COVID and, and, you know, maybe not even like the COVID impact, but then like you've got, you talk about environmental unrest, you've got the world's changing at a rapid rate. Right. So we have all these severe weather events happening more than ever. And recently, I mean, this is even sadly between when our podcast, uh, for the first podcast happened and, and now, um, all the unrest in Ukraine, like there's a war raging. So, man, I just threw a ton of at you, but, uh, let's talk about COVID and, and, and how you've seen that impact. Um, some people on your end as it as on your end as it pertains to mental health. Yeah, they, all great points, and I think in a way, like the starting point could be could be very overwhelming, given all those layers from the political to the social to the environmental to uh, to the fighting on a global scale to this virus that's continuing to ebb and flow. I, I do think a, a starting point from my side of things is. COVID has allowed us, it's given us an entry point to sort of normalizing the conversation around mental health in general, because, How so? well, so, okay. So there's a saying, right. That I'm going to, I'm going to take down in a second, but the saying is we're all in the same boat, which I hate, I hate that saying. I think what we're in is we're, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different parts of the storm and we have very different boats depending on our privilege, our opportunities, our access to care, our health equity, uh, our socioeconomic status. But what it's done is it said, it's given us this, this talking point to say, let's identify what this experience has been like for us. Understanding that there is data that shows anxiety, depression, burnout, substance use, relationship problems have really impacted a significant portion of our population just through the COVID layer. So COVID, for all the disruption and all the distress, has allowed us the opportunity to talk about these things because they're so deeply human, right? Very few of us have gotten through the past few years without being 
you know, impacted in some way. There, there's been disruption for all of us in some way, shape or form. And one of those layers is on our emotional, psychological health and well-being. So it's allowed that talking point. One of those biggest factors that we're seeing is this, this conversation around burnout, right? Burnout is this, this thing that is getting talked about. And it's often discussed from this position of it's sort of your problem, right? Adam, we got to fix your burnout, right? And it gets blamed on the individual. And yet what we fail to recognize is that burnout comes first and foremost from external drivers, right? The reason that people are individually experiencing burnout is that they're in an environment where pressures exceed capacity to cope, right? So the analogy I always use with that is, you know, if you're in the middle of a burning building, you don't need more flame resistant clothing. You need to get the hell out of the burning building, right? And, right. and that's where we've been. Like we have, we have a duty to take care of ourselves when we're in distressing situations, but we're not going to be optimally healthy physically or mentally until we can be in a, a situation where we're physically safe. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I'm I'm taking a few notes down here too, but burnout where pressures exceed outside. Yes, yeah, so external pressures, whatever they external may be, pressures, that's right. continue to exceed our capacity to cope with them. Yeah. Right. So burnout oh, that's awesome. comes from this external driving factor and or factors. And one of the areas like there's the, the personal experience of burnout has really three different pieces. It's first exhaustion which makes sense, right? We're, we're exhausted physically, emotionally, spiritually, and we can't really catch back up to our baseline. The, the second is what's called depersonalization, which is just a fancy word. That means we get kind of irritable with others and we lose our empathy and compassion. And we start to see their needs as just another thing that we have to deal with, another to-do list item. And the third is this reduced sense of satisfaction, right? We just, we don't feel like we're doing a good job or not living up to our standards, or we're not contributing in a meaningful way. That's the personal experience of burnout that so many people have been, uh, have been experiencing the past few years. Yeah, that's, I mean, I would say from the athletes I work with, that's probably um, one of the main things that I hear from them in terms of burnout coming from, coming from work, coming from family, coming from training, you know, if, if we're not, um, kind of seeking balance and we'll get into that, what that means, um, as we go to, uh, and it comes from so many different directions, but I think that the way you framed it up makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, and that burnout, when you, when you continually have these, you know, major influences and, in, in, you know, trauma and stressors coming from all these different sources, you know, you can't even, you know, if you look to the news for relaxation, I don't think that's helping you any, right? Especially right now. And so that burnout can come from so many different areas and it's, and it's absolutely incredible. So, you know, for, I guess the sake of this conversation, I, I think that there's some more key terms that we can build off of, you know, from burnout. And, and I think burnout probably touches a lot of those key terms. Um, but to help frame the rest of the conversation up, can you talk about, what like moral injury has to do with mental health and like the COVID implication, everything else yeah. that we talked about as well. Yeah. It, it's another word that's getting a lot of attention these days, moral injury or moral distress. And at its core, that idea is our connection to human suffering. Right. And it, we really think about moral distress or moral injury as having three ways that that builds. So the first could be your own personal experience right? I am exposed to human suffering. And where we're seeing that a lot is in our healthcare professionals who have been working on the front lines and, and seeing COVID firsthand and the disruption on their individual patients, but also on their families. So personal experience is, is layer one. The second is sort of, it's called bearing witness to. So seeing maybe not your personal experience, but right next door, right? Somebody that you're, you're interacting with, a colleague, a friend, you're seeing the situation unfold for them. The third is learning about, right? Learning about, hearing about, reading about. The news is a major factor there. These situations that relate to human suffering. And what we're seeing right now is we look at the situation unfold in the Ukraine is it's absolutely devastating. And so many people have, they're burned out, they have moral injury, and it's really hard to be paying attention to that because they're already morally distressed. 
right? So this, an offshoot of this is often called, you know, compassion fatigue, right? Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, it's another kind of buzzy, buzzy, buzzy term. Right? Yeah. Compassion fatigue. If you look at it, it's going to tell you it's the cost of caring. Well, in a lot of ways, compassion is actually a, a key factor in human vitality. Compassion towards others, towards other beings, really, for the most part, fills us up. It, it recharges our battery. Compassion is somewhat draining, but it's more rewarding. The problem with caring, and this is what often gets missed, it's not the caring that is the problem. It's when we're caring for something and hopelessness and helplessness are tied to it, right? And this is what we've mm-hmm. seen in, in COVID, especially for healthcare workers. They're caring so much, and yet for years, it's felt hopeless. It's felt helpless, right? This doesn't, we don't have an end in sight. We're not sure when it's going to get better. There's nothing I can do about it. When we look at situations like like what's happening in the Ukraine, those factors are very much at play for us, at least here in the States, right? We don't have a lot of hope for what's going to happen next. We certainly don't have any immediate control factors to make this better. So it's not the caring that is the cost that burdens us. It's when that caring is attached to things that have hopelessness and helplessness associated with them. Got you. And so it's it's not to say that you shouldn't care about your your fellow man and and uh, I don't know um, go against any um, local call it mask or vaccine mandate because you just don't care anymore. It's more more about genuinely caring about why you would want to do that and in, in what disassociating from I don't know uh, a, a hopelessness or a helplessness aspect of it or do I got that right? Yeah, I think it's, it's hard, right? Because I think part of it is we, we want people to care, right? It's, it's a show of humanity and right. connection. Yeah. And I think it's an important recognition to, to know when, when that care has those elements connected to it, because those are the elements that are going to come back and be distressful to you in the long run, right? Not having the ability to have hope, not having the ability to, to have help or control. Those are the areas that really provide us a lot of distress. Got you. So it's a, you know, two other, two other words, because they, they kind of, all of these kind of play off each other too, because where I was going with that compassion fatigue aspect is like, well, do you just focus on the things that you can control or can't, or, you know, and, and don't deal with the stuff that you can't control then. But then I, I believe that that brings in some like anxiety, right? And anxiety can lead to depression. So can you, can you give us a little bit more context of what anxiety is and, and then we'll also talk about depression? Sure. Yeah. And, and you're right, Adam, they're all kind of woven together and have overlapping areas and a lot of similarities. So I, I do a lot of outreach and give a lot of talks. And often what I'll, I'll do when I talk about anxiety is I'll say to the room, like, all right, quick show of hands. If you've ever felt anxiety in your life, raise your hand. Right. And yeah, right. So most of the time, I have a room full of honest, genuine people and everybody raises their hand. But once in a while, you know, somebody, you know, stoic and doesn't want to admit it. And the, the reason I do that is, again, anxiety is a very normal human reaction, right? I, I haven't met anybody in my life that hasn't felt anxiety in some way, shape or form related to something. But it's important to understand the building blocks of anxiety, right? And there are three. Totally. Yeah. So the first is uncertainty right? When we don't know, when we don't have clarity, when we can't predict, that's the first thing that builds anxiety. And again, if we just look at the past two years, it's been a lot of this, gosh, I don't know what's going to happen, right? I don't know what the direction of COVID is taking. I don't know what this means for my health, my family's health, what's going to happen with my kid's school. How is this going to be, right? When we don't have predictability, thought spirals start to happen. The second is that control piece, right? We need to have influence over our own safety, right? We need to feel as though there's something I can do, right? In response to, or in pro action to, right? Here are my steps I can take. And again, that layer has been very rocky the past few years. The last building block of anxiety is a threat to something of value, right? A threat to something you care about. So the, the nice thing, if you will, the silver lining of anxiety is it really does point us to values, right? If you didn't care about something, you wouldn't get anxious about it if it were threatened, right? So silly joke, you know, I've got my nice cup of coffee here. If somebody was going to threaten my cup of coffee, I'd say, go ahead, man, take it. It's yours, right? No anxiety about my coffee being threatened. But if you threaten my kids, 
like, all right, that's, that's a whole different situation. Like now, now I'm defending, I'm getting anxious. I'm figuring out a response. So the backdoor way to play with anxiety is to look at what values it's pointing to, because that's a really important element in that whole um, constellation. Yeah. Yeah. That's that three prong approach or the, the three elements to anxiety, I think is really good to help shape that up. And then I think for our listeners, I think they can then see how like a broad aspect like anxiety can then lead to more specific compassion fatigue, that moral injury, and maybe this all encompassing umbrella of burnout or something. Yeah. And you could layer that, right? You could think about your own personal life. You could think about your community. You could think about the world mm -hmm. at large, and they're going to have different elements of, of all of those components, but really challenge people if you're, if you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling anxious to go back and, and think about those three layers, what feels like it's unpredictable right now, what feels like you don't have control right now, and what value do you own that's being threatened in this moment? Yeah, exactly. So where, do, where does depression fit in some of the, in all of, all yeah. of that, I should say. Yeah. Again, depression, there's some overlap. There's a unique experience. It's, uh, again, very, a, a very high level concern right now. And again, some of the, the development of depression usually comes first and foremost with a sense of loss, right? And we can think about loss in a number of ways. So for anybody listening, who's ever lost a loved one, family member, friend, pet, patient, when somebody you care about passes away, we process that as grief, right? There's sadness there. Well, we can experience loss in all kinds of ways that are not direct loss of life, but psychological, right? And these could be things like loss of meaning, right? Loss of purpose. Those are two huge elements of depression building, right? And that could mean very different things based on your individual circumstance. Uh, loss of relationships, right? Loss of uh, getting your identity needs met, right? When we go back to the beginning of COVID, one of the things that really impacted athletes' mental health was loss of events, right? You know, we, we compass our lives in direction to events that are deeply meaningful for us. And when you took them all away, people were really struggling, right? I don't know what yeah. to do. I feel directionless and lost. Loss is huge. Then when you factor in hopelessness and helplessness on top of it, those are really the major building blocks that we see impact the development of depression for people. Yeah, that all um, that all makes sense. It's a little heavy, but it makes sense, right? Yeah. And you know, I'd be remiss to to talk about you know we're talking about athletes, right? And and anything from you know the Tokyo Games being uh, moved around and having you know elites have to shift a lot of things. There was a lot of people that um, experienced a lot of that, a lot of those elements leading up to that in the, you know, competitive setting, but I'd be remiss to talk about, you know, the, some of these specific groups that are just dealing with this since day one of COVID, right? Like the healthcare workers, the, the, uh, f working mothers, you know, the, the people, you know, families with kids, like, I mean, that's a whole other element too, that I have not had to deal with. Right. And so, uh, people at the grocery store, so talk a little bit about how some of those groups have been experiencing this. And I, I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't even say to tell us how those people have been impacted. I think a lot of people understand how, how that is, but can you talk about how some of like even compassion fatigue would, would work into how we're experiencing this as a society, like how these terms kind of worked? Yeah. Yeah. I, those are all really important groups to think about, right? There, there's, a large scale meta analysis study published last year, March of 2021, that looked at 65 studies, 97,000 healthcare workers across 21 countries. So, very broad sweep. Yeah, yeah that's huge. Good. And they were interested in depression, anxiety, and post traumatic stress disorder concerns in those healthcare workers. And the number there is staggering. So, low 20% in the moderate range for anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Those are the moderate band is the band of clinical significance. It's going to get you a diagnosis and a recommended treatment. More importantly, in my opinion, was anxiety and depression in the mild category was scoring around 36%. So greater than one in every three healthcare workers was walking around with a mild level of anxiety and depression. And often when it's mild, nobody knows about it. We're suffering in silence. We're, 
We don't feel like, ah, nobody, people aren't going to get this. I can't share this. Other people are struggling way more than I am. So I have guilt about sharing my struggles. And so we know that there's just a lot of people in that setting, healthcare workers who are struggling greatly. We're going to see post-traumatic burnout, post-traumatic moral injury, post-traumatic compassion fatigue in completely new ways that we're going to be dealing with and treating and helping support for years, if not decades to come for those in a healthcare space. That's part one. Working mothers is, is another group that we need to give a lot of attention to. And there's data that shows that compared to working dads, working mothers through the pandemic have had higher levels of stress, anxiety, and lower resiliency compared to working dads. And the reason is it's not their fault. So we need to start there. The reason is they're taking on what's called more cognitive load than working dads. So working moms have disproportionately taken on more of the household duties more of the safety checks, more of the thinking through about social relationships, more of the navigating text chats with their friends and their moms and the social network. And it's creating this cognitive load space that is becoming burdensome. It's a silent layer that often doesn't get talked about. It's one of the most important factors in the development of burnout is the nature of cognitive load. So those two groups specifically are just getting decimated and we're not often talking about it the way that we need to. I worry about this idea of, you know, a new normal, right? Where, where there's going to be this pressure from a big part of those in the storm on yachts, sipping martinis the past two years, not recognizing that people have been at the front of the storm getting battered by rain and wind and lightning, and they're down to one oar and their ship is falling apart. It's going to take those folks a long time to recover. And we're going to do a disservice to our global humanity if we don't find a way to help support their recovery. Yeah, um, completely agree with that. And it's, you know, we're still in the thick of this too. As you said, I mean, we're going to be healthcare workers, sure, dealing with that for decades to come. Um, where my mind goes at that, and I haven't like laid this out in the outline, but I was, I'm curious too, just like kids in, in school, kids in their developmental states of being, you know, and that goes from anything from, I don't know, uh, preschool, early grade school, all the way through, you know, the, the kind of that graduation trying to find a job. I mean, there's generations here that will, I mean, everybody's been affected, right? But like, what, what is your take on say, kids going through this and potentially what the outcomes or how does that end? You know, it's something that we haven't dealt with before. What's, what's Dr. Ross's take on yeah, that? Yeah, it's what, a, it's challenging. Right. And give you a little, little story. So my kids are 10 and seven and this morning getting them ready for school, uh, just yesterday, they, the, our school district, um, let go of mask mandates. And so it was the first day, today's the second day where they're not, a, they, they don't have to wear masks. Our kids wore a mask yesterday and they were like one of the only kids that did so. And so our conversation this morning was around like threading the needle between recognizing and understanding that there's a social element if they're if they're the only kids wearing masks and what is that going to feel like right they're going to be called out they're going to feel alienated there's a safety component that we're still trying to figure out is it safe is it not safe they're vaccinated you know what happens if they catch it how do they feel about it and so my kids are old enough where we have the ability to talk this through and really working to sort of empower them to understand both sides of it and make good decisions collectively. Now, one of the hardest hit groups is the, well, a lot, right? And developmentally different, those younger kids who have known nothing but social isolation in some respects due to safety, physical distancing, masks, right? That we see that some of these kids may feel, you know, this little social delay in terms of those kind of normal interactions. Those older kids, right? Those teenagers, young adults who've missed so many rites of passage, right? You know, I think about like prom, homecoming, graduation, those important things that happen in our, on our teenage years have been missed for a lot of these kids. Those things are going to leave a mark. What that means long-term remains to be seen. But again, we need to be finding ways to, to be responsive to this and helping get our kids, you know, to those developmental normative stages. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, and I think that, you know, one of the primary reasons I bring it up is a lot of people listen to this podcast 
have to have kids and have to deal with that, right? And it and it plays a huge part in their cognitive load because what my athletes and especially my athletes with kids, you know, have to deal with is very different than my athletes who, you know, don't have kids in that regard. If you just like separate it out, no matter what you think of COVID and masks and all this kind of stuff, it's just like you have to understand this, like the cognitive load is way different than in 2019, right? And kind of where where I work, say in a performance setting, is working with athletes to get them more resilient to physical and mental stress or fatigue, if you will, and uh, say distractions in life that take us away from uh, achieving our goals, right? Or navigating all the rest of life stuff like we've been talking about. Um, we're talking about all this stuff that like like puts us down, right? Compassion, fatigue, moral injury, burnout, anxiety, depression, right? So in the notes that you sent me there, you know, there's a model for resiliency and, and where my brain goes with that is like, well, I'm trying to develop resiliency in an athlete. B is primarily physical and there's a lot of mental that goes on with it, but there are tools that I use in order to get an athlete performing very well to withstand outside forces coming in to handle stuff, right? And I, I think that there's some similarities there. I don't know. I'd say let's get into that model of resiliency that you talk about, especially to, to the trauma-informed care. Um, however, I'm going to kind of play off of that where I see it kind of working in, say, in coaching and with athletes as well, because I do think that there are some similarities with that. Huge, right? And I know, yeah. like, let's just take the lens of flow for a minute. And I know you love sure. the idea of flow as much as I do. And yeah. flow is flow is my jam. Yeah, it's so good, right? And in the endurance space, flow is really important. Now, I often I think about this idea, I call them flow robbers, right? What are the what are going to be the anti-flow things that that allow us not to get into flow? The biggest flow robber that we have is distraction. Right? Not totally. being present. And if you think about all the elements that allow us to not be present, cognitive load is a big one. Right. So even as I'm thinking about this conversation with you, I could have one part of my mind going through, okay, I wonder, okay, this is the first day we're trying to nuance this mask situation with my kids. How's it going? I don't have any predictability. I don't have any control. I could spend a lot of time dancing around anxiety questions that creep up about that situation because I care about them. It's a threat to something I value. So a flow robber that we're seeing in the past two years, cognitive load, anxiety, exposure to moral distress, all of those things are going to impact our ability to be deeply focused and deeply present, right? So we have to start there, whether you're an athlete or not an athlete, that applies to humanity in general. So I think one of the, one of the ideas around developing a resiliency framework, the, the first and foremost thing is awareness, right? One of my favorite sayings, you cannot change what you are not aware of. So we need to bring awareness and attention to this. One of the most important pieces I think about the initial part of this conversation is we have to outline it. We have to talk about these things. We have to give them labels and, and names so that people feel comfortable identifying them. Like, yep, that's I'm experiencing that. That makes sense, right? So that we can understand then how it impacts your life as a human being first and an athlete second. Totally. And within that, I mean, awareness, awareness is a, that's a huge one. And we're, we're going to spend a ton more time on awareness. So I'd say we'll get to that here kind of in a minute, but in terms of, the, I like that term flow robbers. I mean, that's, man, I, we could go, we could go a lot of different ways on that too. Um, but anything that does distract from, um, the attention I think is huge. And when we're, when we're looking at what it takes to even start, I think like in a camp setting for us, for example, if we got athletes that, it's, you know, 20 athletes that come to a road training camp, we always start with safety first because no, no one is going to want to ride their bike, let alone be able to do a, a time trial uphill for 20 minutes. If they don't feel safe, if they feel like they're going to get pegged by a car, sorry, I ain't going right. And so when it comes to that, um, resiliency or developing the ability to stave off some of that and focus, uh, you know, on flow or, 
anything else, I mean, it kind of starts with safety. And the other kind of bullet points to that resiliency, safety, capacity to be calm, connection and belonging, self-efficacy, which I think is huge with athletes, right? And that future orientation, like where we're going. Um, Could you break down those aspects just a little bit more and then we'll transition into like that balance and awareness aspect? Yeah, absolutely. And and you're right, safety has to come first and, and physical safety first more than anything. Right. None of those other resiliency skills matter if you're in an unsafe building, right? Like the whole idea of burnout, if you're in the middle of a burning building, you don't need to focus on mindfulness or deep breathing. You can get the hell out of the building. Right. And again, one of the disservices I see is so much of this, you're going to read it right about resiliency is take a deep breath, go outside, eat salads, not candy bars. Right. Well, great ideas. They only count if you have the opportunity to engage in them. And if I'm going to harp on the storm analogy again, it's easy to do when you're on a yacht in a sunny part of the storm. Harder to do when you're in a broken down boat with one oar and you're getting pounded with rain. And so, again, we have to start there. Opportunity for this stuff matters most. The first thing is physical safety and whatever capacity that means. We need to get to a place where physically we're unharmed and we can predict and have control that we're going to remain safe. The psychological safety then is the second piece. Once we're physically safe, we need to be able to have the psychological mechanism to have prediction. Like, okay, I'm safe now and I'm going to continue to be safe, right? I'm going to continue to have control over my well-being. And then within that is we need not only transparency, we need to continue to understand and have data that's going to suggest that we're going to continue to be in this place. But this is where we need communication. We need the opportunity to reflect on what we've been through. We need the opportunity to, to share those experiences in a, in, in a way that we feel the other person's going to understand, support, and validate, and not judge or criticize or tell us to do something different. That's all so critical and safety first. Totally. Yeah, and that safety, I mean, it, it, it allows you to build from there, right? It, call it the, the kind of a pyramid for uh, that. Maslow's hierarchy, right? That's where my brain goes in terms of um, how you can achieve um, self-actualization. Self-actualization is kind of his thing um, or flow as it pertains to uh, the athlete context setting or happy, just pure happiness, um, right? Which some people, you know, maybe listening here is like, yeah, sports are great, but I just want to be happy. Well, it all starts with that kind of that context of being safe and then builds from there. Absolutely. Yeah, and and from there, really, the second step is understanding we have amazing capacity to regulate our experiences in mind and body, usually through breathing, right? And and my take on breathing is it's old as dirt, right? And we've heard this forever, right? Like we've said it, we've heard it when you're upset, just take a breath, right? Mm -hmm. It's woven in our DNA and our collective conscious that breathing helps. And we have a lot of data that shows now that just one minute of regulated, slow breathing is going to turn off any of that sympathetic nervous system activity we have, cortisol, adrenaline, stress, anxiety, and it's going to move us into this parasympathetic type of approach, right? That's kind of the rest and digest system. It gets us to a place where we can improve our sense of calm, improve our focus. And when you can do that one minute, just try it. One minute, slow, deep breathing brings our bodies down. It slows down the treadmill of thoughts. And when you put those two things together, reduced physiology, slower thinking, we can then really approach whatever comes next in our day with a a more proactive, productive sense of agency. So I'm a huge, huge proponent of breathing. Okay. Turns out pretty pretty good for you. If you're not breathing, you're having a rough day. (laughs) That's right. But uh, full transparency aside, I do nothing in the way of, uh, like a framework of breathing or, uh, there's a lot of like even certifications out there on breath work, meditation, all this kind of stuff. However, I do it. I implement it with athletes, whether I'm on the bike next to them or I'm talking to them or, you know, in the training peaks, uh, portal dialoguing, this kind of thing. I'm cu- where I'm going with this is <clears throat> curious if you have some sort of kind of context or framework that our listeners can use with that, if there's more to talk about it. But my approach to it is like, 
as you just said, you described kind of like physiologically what happens, say, even at a, um, like a hormonal level, why breathing is good and why it brings you to a place where you can be calm or more grounding, but it effectively, um, I mean, people are probably going to like rake me over the coals like Jason Coop, but it's going to make you more efficient because when you're stressed out, you're over breathing, you're wasting energy, your brain's going in all these different directions. But if all of a sudden you start breathing more deeply and I come up alongside someone, I say, okay, wiggle your fingers, breathe. Right. So just like, cause it gets them to relax their hands with their normally like death gripping their hands, climbing up a hill climb, for example, mm-hmm. breathe. All right. Deep breath. Here we go. Yeah. And, and, and all, it just takes that, Yeah, you know, in the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's my whole approach on that is emotionally intelligent athletes are going to be more away, more aware, and they're going to make better decisions. And in mm-hmm. the landscape that, that we play in endurance sports, where we're out there for, you know, sometimes minutes, but sometimes hours and sometimes days, making good decisions is going to be critical to not only enjoying the experience, which I think is a huge part of why we do this in the first place. It's going to allow you to perform better. There's a great saying, right? Mindfulness, which is another buzzword. Mindfulness isn't difficult. What's difficult is remembering to be mindful. So we, <laughs> we need to find a way to cue, totally. cue this up in our lives so that we don't have to spend 15 minutes on a meditation cushion, but we do need to check in daily and think about our breathing. Oh, we're, I haven't been paying attention to my breathing. Let me just take a minute. <sighs> the more we do that in the cadence of a regular day, the better able we're going to be able to do it when we're on the bike, on a trail, out there for hours and we're, we're, you know, maybe lost in some type of performance, something, right? Having something to come back to is critical and the breath is a great place for that. Yeah. Um, and the last word I'll, or the last thing I'll say about that is, uh, having a, you said coming back to having something to come back to, right? I think mantras are a pretty good way of doing that, especially in the moment in competition, all this kind of stuff. It's part of your self-talk, but it cues us to come back to the breath. So it could be as simple as breathe, yeah, focus, yeah, or I mean, you can come up with any slogan you want that'll bring you back to that. But having a mantra to cue the mind in order to do the physiological thing to calm, then you can return back to that flow state. Totally. One one of the challenges I'll put athletes through that I'm working with is every time you change your clothes, I want you to use changing your clothes as a cue for paying attention to your breath and working to settle it down. And there's a couple of reasons I like it. You know, for most of us, especially on the athletic side, we change our clothes several times a day. And again, going back to flow robbers, distraction, having a lot of things on our mind impacts our performance. And often if, if folks out there are like me, I'm often working out, so I find a way to make it happen in the middle of my day, especially this time of year. And so I'm working, And I'm often letting go of something at work that I'm thinking about or working on. And then I'm moving into working out training. And if I'm still thinking about the last thing or the next thing while I'm on the bike or in my running shoes, it's going to impact my ability to be present. So I love that idea is it's a transition, right? We're transitioning identity, we're transitioning behavior, and we're transitioning approach, right? So we're putting on our bike shorts, getting on our running shoes. Oh, that's my cue. All right, I can take slow, deep, rhythmic breaths as I'm moving. I don't have to stop. I don't have to take time out of my day. That is good for you. Don't get me wrong. But it can be this cue to help us start to train that muscle of, of awareness, of focus, of breath work. Totally. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because as soon as I throw some spandex on, it's go time. Like, done. However, I do procrastinate quite a bit with, I'll answer that last email. I'll take that last call. But but as soon as the spandex are on, man, game time. Yeah, uh-huh. for sure. <laughs> okay, so just to kind of rip through the last um, couple bullet points here, how does connection and belonging play into this? And then we'll get into that self-efficacy and then a future outcome or orientation. Yeah, so, so yeah, going back to the trauma-informed care model, connection and belonging is, is really then kind of that third step. And if you think about those building blocks, right, safety first, down-regulating our system, in body, in mind, and then we need to reach out and have support, right? And so connection belonging is kind of, it's an intuitive piece for most of us. We know that we need 
connection and belonging. And one of the biggest hardships at the start of the pandemic was physical distancing and not being able to be around our people, right? So connection and belonging is important for a few reasons. One, it's that layer of being able to actually get validation and support, right? People around me can understand my experiences that they, you know, they recognize them as deeply human. And I feel as though they get it, right? That part is critical. But then we, we often forget that we're doing that for other people as well. That's compassion, right? This urge to help, this urge to act. And that compassion is often, you know, really recharging for us. It really helps us. So connection and belonging is a, is a critical element in that process of trauma-informed resiliency. Totally agree. How does, how does self-efficacy play into it? Yeah. So then after that, you get into these sort of cognitive models, right? Once you're physically safe and you feel connected to people, then you get into being able to, to work on higher order thinking, right? And if we just go back to connection and belonging again, like think about my, you know, my role as a dad, you know, when my kids are up, upset or stressed about whatever, what do they want more than anything? They don't want me to solve their problems. They want to touch me. They want to be, they want to cuddle. They want to hug, right? Daddy cuddle me. You got it, right? We need to feel that sense of safety. And you can almost feel this, like the, the breath comes in. <sighs> we have that deep reflex and relaxation. Sometimes if you get into the weeds on it, what we'll often recommend people do is it's called a 20 second hug, right? When you're feeling stressed, go to your partner, community member, not a community member, somebody that you love that you feel safe with. <laughs> hug them for 20 seconds. You don't, we don't usually hug that long. Hug for 20 yeah, seconds. It's a long hug. It's a long hug. But watch what happens yeah. right around the 10 second mark, 12 second mark. There's this big sigh that happens. It's really important. Hmm. Self efficacy is thinking, right? And it's belief system on what you think is possible, right? And it's really shaped first and foremost by your own personal experiences, what you've been through in your life in general, what you've been through on a micro level the last year to two years. Henry Ford is the greatest cliche quote on this whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. That's self-efficacy in a nutshell. It's your belief system and what you think is possible or what you think your limits are. Gotcha. So, I mean, I can definitely see where <laughs> that self view has for future orientation. Uh, but talk to that uh, just for a minute. Yeah. So then future orientation is where we go next. And again, if we go back just to the COVID layer, one of the biggest disruptions, physical distancing was one. The second was the cancellation of so many things. Right. I didn't have a thing to look forward to. My race was canceled. My travel was canceled. I couldn't connect with people that I cared about. All of those elements in this model were threatened and taken away. Future orientation is two things. One, we need to look forward with things that we're excited about, things that provide us meaning, right? Identity, meaning, engagement, so important. But optimism is a big part of that as well. It's really easy for us, you know, to look back at the negative. I screwed this thing up. I didn't say that right. I wish I would have done that differently. And we have this rumination of those things. We need to build an optimism about, you know, one, that we're doing okay, right? And two, that things are going to get better, right? There's that hope level. We, we need to find real hope. Can't be unicorns and rainbows. It can't be made up. It's got to be anchored in reality. But we do need to find ways to think about finding hope, optimism in our daily lives. Well, that's, that's a great summary of that, that model of resiliency, Dr. Ross, that you were, that you were talking about. And, and as I said, you, you know, there's, there's a lot that I can see on that end of how I work with athletes to kind of build, build the athlete to become more resilient for a specific performance outcome. Right. Um, but the, the cognitive side or kind of the emotional side that goes into safety, capacity to be calm, connection, self-efficacy and future orientation. I think a lot of that, um, plays into just all of humanity. Right. And so an athlete is a human. Um, and so there's, there's super big parallels there. Uh, we also talked about, you know, the, those key terms that'll set us up for our part two coming. That's a burnout, moral injury, compassion, fatigue, anxiety, and depression. The reason I want to spend so much time on that is like the, their buzzwords, their, the words that I've heard and athletes have heard out there and even like probably using, but are we using them properly? You know, um, do we fully understand them? So I think having a better understanding of that is, is really important with where we're going with this conversation. And, you know, with COVID looming here in year three, um, changing climate and now the war in Ukraine, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. So I think that, you know, mental health 
is <laughs> never been more important to start to cultivate. Uh, Dr. Ross, we talked a lot today about mental health. Is there anything kind of in summary of part one that you want our listeners to make sure they, they remember from this part one series? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a couple things stand out. So the trauma informed resiliency model is really based on the idea of what has happened to you, not what is wrong with you. And I think we need to take that to the mental health layer. Mental health is what is going on with you, not what is wrong with you. We all have mental health, all of us. And it's our way of relating to ourselves and the world and how we regulate our emotional experiences. And it, it is shaped by environmental factors. And the reason I think these conversations are so important is it's a starting point to recognize that those environmental factors right now can be extremely distressing. You, you don't need to have a personal experience with COVID to have distress or trauma or anxiety in the past two years. So many people I've talked to have felt guilty, like I shouldn't be feeling the way I'm feeling because so-and-so is working on the front lines and I'm relatively safe. doesn't matter. You're a human being and, and you have a right to have those experiences. So I think this whole idea around mental health is really understanding we all have mental health and we all have these experiences. They're deeply human in nature. Giving awareness and attention to them allows us to then figure out exactly what we need to live in an optimal way, in alignment with our values, with our meaning, with our purpose, and to perform optimally. And for athletes, performing optimally is such a meaningful part of our, our identities, both in and out of sport. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And we'll get into uh, that element even more so in part two. So Dr. Ross, uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for part one. For our listeners, uh, make sure to catch part two and uh, we'll be cultivating mental health as we do.